Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Brian. Thank you for your message. Uh, I'll just wait for a few people to join and I'll just wait for your comments to see if you can hear me and see me. Thank you. Um, okay, can can others hear me? Farah, can you hear me? Zara, can you hear me? Ah. Uh, yes, I'm good, thank you. Okay, all right, so I think most people can hear me now. You can hear me, okay, that's brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, thanks. Okay, all right, we've, we've got good numbers now. I think we can start, okay. So my name is Nasir. I am a GP trainee in the NHS. Um, I started my GP training last year in August. Um, and when I did, I wanted to share my experience because I wanted to tell others how to enter GP training. And I found the process very easy. So I thought I should share it with others. Um, last year, I arranged a conference in London for this, and I planned on doing something similar this year, but but, but I could not because of coronavirus. Um, so anyway, I'm doing this live session and it's my first live session. So if I make any mistakes, please forgive me. Uh, now I'm going, I've prepared a presentation for today and I'm going to share it with you. My only request is if, if you want, you can keep a paper and pen with you and you can take notes if you want. Um, thank you. Okay. So I've shared the screen. So I've shared this presentation. Let me know if you can see the presentation. You should be able to see it. Um, most people can hear me. So if you can't hear me, uh, maybe check your connection, maybe log out and log in again. Let me know if you can see the presentation and then I will start. Okay, you can, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, all right, good, thank you. So the topic for today is how to enter GP training. Um, this the, the, the ideal target audience is um, junior doctors working in the NHS, but even if you're back home, you can still listen and it, it might give you an idea of how you can enter GP training. Um, so let's move on. So this is what we're going to talk about. Um, I've divided today's session into four different parts. Uh, each part will roughly take five minutes. So I'll talk about the overview of the training entry, and then I'll talk about stage one, stage two, stage three, and I'll tell you what they are. After that, I'll take question, questions and answers. So, um, I mean, I'll take questions. So the presentation itself should not take more than half an hour, and then I'll do um, Q&A for half an hour. Thank you. So let's start right away. So the first part, as I said, is overview of training entry. And we'll talk about two things in this section, the application process, how it works, and the recruitment rounds. Uh, if you've got a paper and pen, now is the time to start your note down, uh, start noting down things. So the application process. To enter GP training, you need to go through an entry test. So you need to pass a test. Uh, do not be afraid because it's not a difficult test. Uh, your scores matter in this test. So if you want to get training in, for example, if you want to get training in London, then you need to get a high score. But if you want to get training in most of the other areas, uh, then your scores do not make a big difference. So I hope that makes sense. And it's only the entry test which matters. So there is no interview in GP training entry. There is an interview in most of the other specialties, like if you wish to enter internal medicine training, you have to go through an interview, but for GP training, there is no interview, just an entry test. 
Now, let's talk a bit more about the application process. So the way it works is the first part is called stage one or long listing. In the past, it was called stage one, but now it's called long listing. Um, we'll talk about this in detail. Um, this is basically just the online application process. So it's just um, submitting your online application. That's stage one. Stage two is also called MSRA, multi-specialty recruitment assessment. It's uh, an MCQ type of test, which you need to take. And then the last part is stage three, which is selection assessment center, which is kind of like flap two, which is an OSCE based exam. We'll talk about all of this in a bit more detail in, in other parts, so don't worry. So just to summarize, there's an entry test, scores matter, uh, there is no interview. Uh, now let's move on to the recruitment rounds. There are three recruitment rounds. Round one, then round one re-edward, which is the second round, and then round two, which is the third round. So there are three rounds, but they're only called round one, round one re-edward and round two. I, I'll give you a bit of um, an idea of their timelines. Um, you can find all of this information on my website and also on the official GP recruitment website. So even if you miss something here, don't worry, you can find it later. So round one is advertised in October, applications open in November, which is called stage one, as I explained a bit uh, a few minutes ago. And then stage two is in January, stage three in February, results come out in March and your training starts in August. So round one opens in November. So for example, later this year, round one will open in November this year and training will start in August next year. That's round one. And round one has the maximum number of seats. Uh, I think last year there were around 4,000 seats in round one for GP training, uh, which is a big number. But not all of those seats are taken. Uh, so after round one finishes, there are still seats left over. And then they advertise round one again, which is called round one re-edward. Uh, applications open in February. So for example, applications will open next year uh, in Feb 2021, and training will again start in August around the same time uh, over the leftover seats. So if you want to get training um, in a very popular area like London, it's best to apply in round one because there might not be any seats left in round one re-Edward. And then after round one re-Edward, there are still seats left over, which are then advertised in round two in July. And training starts in February. So for example, um, I don't know about this year because things are a bit haphazard, but next year um, training applications will open in July and then training will start the next year in Feb. But there, this would only be for leftover seats, so there would not be a lot of seats left. So again, if you want to get into a popular area, it's best to apply in round one. I hope all of this makes sense. And that, is the end of part, the first part of my presentation, which is the overview. Now I'm going to pause here for a minute and take any questions uh, that you might have for the application process or recruitment rounds, just a question or two, um, if anyone has any questions. Uh, thanks Rahul for your comment. Uh, Okay, I don't see any questions, so that's fine. Uh, I'll take questions at the end as well. Uh, okay, all right. So that is the overview. Um, we're running on time so far. Um, also, um, we'll go to we'll go through the eligibility criteria in a bit. Um, Asad, no, there is no difference in GP training in London and elsewhere, but there is a, a big difference in life in London and elsewhere, but the training is, is the same. We'll go through the eligibility criteria in a bit. So let's let's move on. So the second part is stage one or long listing. Stage one, as I explained earlier, it's just the applica online application process that's called stage one. Stage one itself is not a test. Um, so in this section, we'll talk about the eligibility criteria and also how you will apply for the training. So 
you need to have GMC registration by the time you start training. So you don't need to have GMC registration when you're applying for training, but you must have it when you start training. Having said that, it's best to apply for GP training after you've been in the system for a year or two. And I'm sure my colleagues and friends who are in training programs will agree with me. Uh, I, I can see that a few of them are watching this as well. So I'm sure they will tell you that it's best to work in the NHS for a year or two as an non-trainee and then apply for training. But technically you can apply even from your home country. The second thing you need is 24 months of clinical experience by the time you start training. And again, this has to be by the time you start training and not, <laughs> and not at the time of application. Number three, you need crest form. Uh, sorry about this. <laughs> so uh, you need your crest form. Um, and we'll talk about this in detail in Q&A if anyone has any questions. So I hope all of you know what crest form is. It's a form which um, certifies that you are at the same level of an F2 doctor. And then the last thing you need is an ALS certificate from Rhesus Council UK. So the, this is the basic eligibility criteria. Someone was asking me if we need driving license. No, you do not. But as a GP trainee, you'll have to do a lot of home visits. So it's best if you have a driving license and if you can drive by the time you start your training. So th that, that is it for the eligibility criteria. Um, you don't need any anything. Uh, this, these are the basic things, but I would still advise you to go to the GP recruitment website and go through the detailed eligibility criteria. Uh, now, how to apply. First of all, you'll need to make an account on oriel.nhs.uk. Uh, making an account is very easy. It's kind of like um, how you make an account on your NHS jobs website. So it's this, it's a bit like that. Once you've made an account, go to the Applications tab. Uh, go to Search My Applications and select or write General Practice. Then select General Practice SD1. Fill the application, which will be like NHS Jobs. Attach relevant documents. So when I applied last year, all I needed to attach was my BRP, which is my visa, and an ALS certificate. Uh, also the competency form, I think. And then you submit the application. So that is it. Make an account, go to applications, search applications, GPSD1, fill the application and apply. You can find all of this on my website as well. So if you miss any of this, don't worry about this. And that is it for the second part. Now, if anyone has any questions about how to apply or the eligibility criteria, let, let me know. Uh, yeah, so someone's asking if it has to be from Rhesus Council. Uh, so it has to be certified by Rhesus Council UK or an equi equivalent body. Uh, I don't know if European Rhesus Council ALS would be accepted or not, but you can ask the GP recruitment team by sending them an email. They will let you know. Uh, what is the competency certificate? So if you go to the ODL website and search for the crest form, or just go to Google and write crest, C-R-E-S-T, uh, crest Oriel, you'll get the certificate, go through it, read it, and you will know what it is. Uh, yes, you need the crest form when you're applying for GP training. Rhesus Council UK is a, is a council which is certified to give you the ALS certificate. Yes, you can make Oriel account before you join the NHS, but it's, uh, but it's best that you work as a non-trainee first, as I was explaining earlier. Yes, most trusts do provide study budget for ALS. No, American Heart Association ALS is not accepted. Uh, I'll take more questions later on. Uh, I'll just check if there's 24. So you need to have 24 months experience anywhere in the world. It does not have to be in the UK, it can be anywhere. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Milo. Uh, okay, so I think Sharjeel is agreeing with what I said about joining 
as a non-trainee first. Um, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, good to see you. So let's move on to the next part. Uh, so stage, let's talk about stage two now. This is now called multi-specialty recruitment assessment. We'll talk about two things here, the pattern of the exam and how to study for it. So let's talk about the pattern first. It has two parts. The first part has professional dilemma questions. You'll have about 58 questions that you need to answer in 110 minutes. And no, that is not a lot of time. The way that these questions work is uh, they can be MCQs or you can be given five options and you need to prioritize these. So for example, they can give you a scenario like you're working in the ward and a nurse comes up to you and tells you that there's a patient who's short of breath. At the same time, one of your colleagues comes up to you and tells you that they're finding it hard to cannulate a patient. At the same time, you get a phone call telling you that uh, your car is not parked at the right place and the parking people want you to go and park your car at the right place. At the same time, your mother calls you and wants to talk to you. And at the same time, uh, your consultant calls you to a board round. So how do you prioritize these tasks? Which one do you do first? Uh, obviously you go in and see the short of breath patient first. Uh, so you, they check if you know how to prioritize tasks. They, they can also be, uh, as I said, MCQs as well. So these are basically questions which check your approach and which check your ethical approach. Uh, they don't really check your clinical knowledge as such. Uh, the second part is clinical problem solving, which are basically just uh, mainly mainly MCQs, 97 questions in 75 minutes. Yeah, so again, not a lot of time to answer these questions, less than a minute for each question. Uh, but the clinical problem solving is a, is a lot like PLAB 1. So if you've passed PLAB 1, you should be able to pass this as well. Um, that, that, is the, that is a basic pattern. Now we'll talk about how to study for it and um, what the preparation is like. So first of all, you need about 100 hours. So you can you can give these 100 hours over a single week, or you can spread it over three, four months, which is better. But you essentially, you need 100 hours to study for this exam. I know a lot of people who manage to pass the exam with just one or two weeks of prep. Um, so 100 hours. Um, there are various different question banks which you can use. There's MCQ Bank, there's Past Medicine, there's eMedica. There are a lot of other question banks as well. Uh, I'll talk about these three because I went through all of them. MCQ Bank is really nice. The questions are short. There are about, a, about 700 questions. So if you go through 700, uh, you can take the exam, which is good. What I don't like about MCQ Bank is the user interface. Uh, past medicine, their user interface is really good. It's brilliant. The questions are fine as well. Um, however, I felt that the questions in the exam were a bit different from past medicine questions. And then eMedica, I think that is the best question bank. Um, the user interface is decent and I hear that they're constantly improving it. And also the, the quality of the questions is brilliant. Um, questions in the exam are very similar to eMedica questions. The only the only downside about eMedica is that it's it's very expensive, but it's definitely worth the money. Uh, eMedica also has uh, mocks, which have different questions from the main question bank. So eMedica is, is really good. There are other question banks like Pass Test and, and a few more. Uh, I think inspiring, uh, Inspire Medics has a question bank as well, which is for free right now, by the way. So go and utilize that. Um, Having said that, uh, most people pass their exam regardless of which question bank they go through. I also know people who went to just half of MCQ bank and just half of past medicine and still pass their exam. So it doesn't really matter which question bank you do. Different people prefer different question banks. Okay. And I don't know how a lot of people are going to feel about this, but you don't need any courses for your MSI or stage two preparation. All you need is just these question banks. If you feel you're getting stuck somewhere, read the read guidelines, read nice guidelines. Um, 
but you don't need to go to any academy or do any courses. Please don't waste your money. Uh, stage two, top tips. Practice as many questions as you can, just like I say for PLAB1. Practice as many timed mocks as you can, because as I was explaining earlier, um, this is a time pressured exam. You have to do a lot in a short time. So the more you practice, the better you will get. Uh, and if you don't do timed mocks, you'll struggle in the exam to finish the exam in time. So timed mocks are essential. So that is it for stage two. If anyone has any questions about stage two, I'll just take just a few questions right now. Uh, yes, Pooja. Um, Pooja is asking if past medicine for GP training is different. Uh, yes, it's it's different. Um, it's slightly less advanced for GP training. Uh, which question bank do I recommend? I think all of them are great. Um, and don't limit yourself to just these three question banks. There are many other question banks as well. Um, if I could go back in time, I think I would do eMedica before any other question bank, but I think they're, they're all really good. Uh, how can you view it? Again, you can find all of this information on my website. Um, thanks, Hatra. Uh, I went through the application process in detail uh, earlier. Um, Yes, Aisha, the 24 month experience can include your one year internship. That is correct. Uh, I can go through the eligibility criteria at the end again. So, uh, yes, Farah, you need to have ALS ideally by the time you start. If you don't, then you can ask them if, if they're willing to give you more time to get your ALS. They might, they might not, but you can ask GP recruitment team if, if that happens. Okay, now I'm moving on to part D, which is the final part of this presentation. Uh, so now I'll talk about stage three or the selection assessment center. Uh, we'll talk about the pattern and how you need to study for this. So this is this is a fun exam. I, I really enjoyed this. Um, it has two parts. The first part itself has three parts. So you've got simulated consultations, just three consultations, one with a patient, one with an attendant, and one with a colleague. So it's kind of like PLAB 2, but in PLAB 2, you had 18 stations. Here, you have just three stations. Um, I really should have used these banners earlier. Uh, so as in PLAB2, you've got 18 stations, and here you've got just, just three, three stations, one with a patient, one with a relative or a carer, and one with a colleague. You have to talk to them. You're given, I think, eight or 10 minutes, um, and you just have to tell yourself that this is a real life scenario and uh, just treat them as a real patient attendant or a colleague. The second part is written prioritization exercise. So you're given five different um, five different situations or tasks, and you've got to prioritize which one you would do first and why. And at the end, you have to reflect on it. And again, you have to write a lot here, and there's not a lot of time. So again, if you don't practice this at home, you'll struggle in the exam. So practice this a lot at home. And practice how you would write, practice writing a lot in, in quick time. Uh, and again, without practice, this will be very difficult in, in the exam. Now, how to study for it and how long it takes. So it takes about 20 to 30 hours. Again, you can do that over a weekend or you can spread it over a few weeks. But 20 to 30 hours is all you need for stage three prep. <sighs> write down the name of this book. Uh, GPST Stage 3 by Richard Hughes and Shivani Tana. Uh, this is all you need for Stage 3 preparation. And it's best to order this right now from Amazon uh, because when time comes for Stage 3, you'll notice that this book will not be available on Amazon because it will become short. You won't find this in the hospital library either because most people would have taken it already. So this, becomes, this book becomes really short near the exam and people struggle to find it. So 
and then you'll see posts on Facebook of people asking for this book. So order this book from Amazon as soon as you can because it won't be available later on. Um, and again, no need for any courses or any academies if you're working in the NHS because this exam is just a test of how you deal with others on a normal working day. So no need for any courses if you're working in the NHS. The top tips are to read the book as much as you can. Ideally read it cover to cover. It won't take more than 30 hours. Practice, practice, practice. So just like lab two, you need to practice. This is the most important thing. During the exam, make yourself believe that you're in a real life setting and you'll pass the exam very easily. So that is it for stage three. Now, if anyone has any questions about stage three or how to go about it. I'll just take a few questions. Uh, stage three is included to go into training. Yes, it is. Um, any questions about stage three right now? Uh, I'm just skimming through this. I don't see any questions about stage three, so I can move on then. The free question bank, Madiha, is um, iMedics. Uh, so just go to Google and look for iMedics. Uh, you can find them in Facebook as well. Uh, uh, Janaid, you can start prep for stage three along with stage two, but stage three prep just takes 20 to 30 hours. So it's best to do this once you're free from stage two. So you, you'll you take stage three after you pass stage two. Uh, yes, that is very true. So if you get a very high score in stage two, you will not have to go through stage three, above 90%. That, that's absolutely true. That's right. How long is stage three for duration? So it, it takes the whole day. Um, I, it, it, it takes the whole day. So think of this as a nine to five day. Uh, yes, stage three is the last part to enter training. If you pass stage three, you've made it to training. Um, depends on which areas you've selected, but yes, that is the last part. Uh, as I was saying, as you can see on the screen as well, no need to go for any courses for stage three if you're working in the NHS. Okay, let's let's move on then. Let's just quickly summarize this. So to enter GP training, you need to pass an entry test. You do not need a portfolio, but it is still best to maintain a portfolio for your ARCP reasons uh, or your, and, uh, um, your appraisal. So it's best to have a portfolio, um, no interview, as I was explaining. There are three parts of the entry process. The first is stage one, which is an online application, and stage two, which is like LAB one, a theory-based uh, MCQ exam. And the last part is stage three, which is a, an OSCE-based exam, like LAB two. Now, uh, now I need to ask for a favor for, from everyone who's, who's here, uh, more than 250 people, which is brilliant, thank you. Um, once this session is over, I'll share a link for a feedback form to see how I did today. Um, if if there's anything that I can do better the next time, let me know in the feedback form. Um, so just if it's okay, I'll ask you to do the feedback form. It won't take more than 60 seconds, I can promise you that. So if you can take 60 seconds out for me, that would be great. You'll find the link to the feedback form on my Facebook page and in the comments section here at the end of this session. So if you can do that, that would be great. Uh, if you need to contact me or, and find any of this information, you'll find it on my website, nasisjourney.com. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, at Nasir's Journey. So I think we're doing well on time. The plan is to start Q&A at 11.30. It is almost 11.30 now. So my only request is if we can keep the questions limited to uh, GP training entry. So we can start now. So I'll, I'll take a few questions. Um, 
Okay, I'll go through this. Uh, stage two is professional dilemma and clinical, I guess, different, pa different paper. Uh, no, so it's uh, it's the same test. You uh, you do the, I, th I don't remember if you do the clinical bit first or the professional dilemma, but once the first part is over, the second part begins on uh, by itself two minutes later. How recruitment is done, you just need to pass the test and select the areas in which you're willing to work and we go forward from there. So it's just this entry test, which I talked about. Where can you find the MCQ bank? So it's mcqbank.co.uk. Uh, how to prepare for the writing part in stage three? Thank you for the question. Again, the same book which I mentioned earlier, um, uh, GPST stage three by Richard Hughes and Shivani Hanna. It has written prioritization exercises as well. Uh, no, so basically there is no interview. So for stage three, there is no interview. Uh, do everyone who clears the exam gets training? Uh, depends on which areas you're selecting. So for example, if you're selecting only London and your score is not high enough, no, you will not get training. But if you're selecting the whole of the UK and you pass the exam, then you will find training. Because as I said, at the end of round one, not all seats are filled. This is why they advertise round one again, and then they advertise round two as well. Uh, <laughs> No, so the training will still be for three years, but uh, at the end of that, there will be two additional years of fellowship, but the training itself will still be for three years only. Um, which site is better for ePortfolio? When I was a non-trainee, I used the JRCPTB ePortfolio. Um, so JRCPTB ePortfolio. Uh, same question and JRCPTB ePortfolio. A lot of trusts give you Horus portfolio, so that's fine as well. Um, passing score. Um, so passing score varies, uh, but I think if you go to the eMedica website uh, and if you do their question banks, so they've given a good description of the passing scores. Um, Honestly, I, I don't remember what the passing score is, so I won't say, but it's kind of like lab when it varies and depends on the aggregate score. Uh, working as a bank assessor, does this experience count towards the 24 month experience? Um, I guess it depends on what the bank experience is. So for example, if you're doing a six month bank, six, I mean, if you're working every day for six months, it should count but I'm not sure. Check this with the GP recruitment people. Send them an email, they will respond. Um, I think I'm getting a lot of questions and it's a bit difficult to navigate through. Um, yes, you can give ALS even if you're not working in the UK. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions. I'll go through all of them. So please bear with me. Uh, yes, you can take ALS even if you're not working in the UK, but it's best to apply for training once you are working in the UK. You can find MCQ Bank on mcqbank.co.uk. Uh, so, I said you can do locums whenever they're available. So right now, because of coronavirus, there aren't many locums, locum jobs available. But before this, there were a lot of locum jobs available. Um, ODL application is pretty straightforward, just like your NHS jobs application. Yes, so once you are a GP trainee, you need to pass your MRC GP exam when you're in training. Uh, you can't take it before that. What is the difference between entry test and MSRA? So MSRA is the first part of the entry test. Uh, how can you book your ALS? Um, go to the Resource Council UK website, find the ALS nearest to you and um, get it booked. Um, you're welcome. Uh, JRCPTB ePortfolio. Um, 
Now, this is a very important question. Can you get your CREST form signed in your home country? Yes, you can, if you have done everything listed in the CREST form. But if you have not done everything listed in the CREST form, please do, do not get it signed because then you're being dishonest. And go through the CREST form. You'll find that it is very difficult to achieve everything listed in the CREST form back home. It's very difficult. But if you feel you, you have done all of that, get it signed. Uh, no, you cannot take MRCGP before you start training, as I explained earlier. Interesting question. So if you're working in pediatric orthopedics, yes, that is enough to get uh, enough experience to get into GP training, provided you meet the eligibility criteria, provided you get your crest form signed. So I've already answered this crest form question. Uh, no, the 24 month experience does not need to be continuous. Um, no, the MRCP one is not mandatory to enter GP training. So your crest form should be signed at the time of your application. If it is not, they might give you additional time to get it signed. Um, we'll round two this year have only professional dilemma questions. So uh, Akash, thank you for this question. It's nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, so it's, it's unclear right now. Uh, keep an eye on the GP recruitment website. Things keep changing because of this coronavirus at present. Uh, Ideally, uh, you should have the crest form before you submit your application. Uh, for the ALS, you need to have it, uh, again, they, uh, for ALS, you, you need to get it done before you start training. Uh, so thank you for this question. I think start working in the NHS and the application pro process itself takes a good four, six or eight months. Um, so even if you start your NHS career, let's say this this year in August, uh, the application opens in November. So it will you'll spend a year as a non-trainee anyway. Whenever you feel that you're ready to start training, go for it. Uh, I worked as a non-trainee for two years, and I feel that experience was needed. Um, Uh, good question, Omar. Uh, there is no limit for, there, basically there, there's no limit on this. You can have as much experience as you have and you can still apply for GP training. So there's no, there are no problems there. I'm really sorry, but I'm getting more questions that I can respond to. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions, but I'll try to go through as many as I can. Uh, but that, so with MRCP one and two, uh, no, you need because you need to have GMC registration. You can't have GMC registration based on MRCP one and two. So you need to pass paces, or you need to go through PLAB to get GMC registration before you can start as a GP training. Uh, so Lecha, thank you for your question. So as long as you're working as a as a doctor, yes, this experience will count. Um, Lisa, as long as you have your GMC registration, yes, you can apply for GP training and get in. So you don't need your driving license to start GP training, but it's very important to have your driving license because you'll need to drive a lot for your home visits when you're, when you're a GP training. Um, Sambu, you're asking for the timeline for round one. Okay, let me find it and go there. Uh, just a second. Here's the timeline for round one. 
Um, thank you for your question. You can select as many areas as you want. There is no limit on that. You can change these areas later on as well, but once you start getting offers, you might not be able to change them or you might still be able to change them. Uh, Okay, Asad, I already answered your questions about the locums. Zeba, yes, you can do ALS even if you're not working. Uh, okay. So what is the crest form? So crest, I'll 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 look for a link and share it as well. So Crest form is a form which checks your eligibility to enter training. Uh, I'm sharing a link for this in the comments section. Um, go through the form, go, go to Oriel and write Oriel Crest. So you go, go to Google and write Oriel Crest and the form will come up. I've shared the link as well. Go through the form and you'll know what the form is. Uh, Pooja, uh, you're asking if it's better to apply for GP training after MRCP part one and two. So MRCP part one and two have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with GP training. Uh, if you have them, that's great. If you don't have them, it doesn't matter. You just need the GMC registration and ideally you should be working in the UK. Um, Deborah, you're asking what is MSRA? We talked about this in detail. So MSRA is multi-specialty recruitment assessment, which is stage two. Um, you can find this in my website as well. Uh, Kenny's Fatma Yasin is asking if you need to go through this process even after passing MRCP. Uh, if you want to become a GP, yes, you need to go through this process. Um, um, Asma, you're constantly asking about how to book the ALS, any website. So go to the Rhesus Council UK website and go from there you can find the nearest ALS for yourself. Um, how easy is it to enter GP training? It's, it's, it's very easy. This is why I'm doing this session because it's very easy to enter GP training. Uh, okay. What rotations should you select? Depends on your past experience, depends on what you've done so far, depends on your interest. Uh, and you might not even get the chance to select these rotations, but I think a and &E is a very useful rotation. Pediatrics is a very useful rotation. Um, Ops and gyne is a very useful rotation. Medicine is also a very useful rotation. Um, okay. Uh, how many years? Okay. Is it easy to get less than full time? Yes, it is. Um, till when is the MSR exam? Well, it can be used it to apply for other specialties too. Yes, you can use it to apply for other specialties as well. Um, and the MSR exam uh, is, uh, I think if you take it in round one, it's um, valid in the round one re-advert as well. But I would suggest, uh, again, checking the official website for this just to make sure um, okay, is ALS compulsory? Can't we apply for the course while we fill the form and do the course later? Yes, you can do that. I did that myself as well. So I was offered GP training somewhere in April, uh, April last year, and I did my ALS in June. So yes, you can do that. So Edith, a gap of 10 years is not a problem if you have GMC registration. Okay. Thank you, Sri. So Aziz, thank you for this question, but this, this varies a lot. Um, every training program has their own entry pathway. So this varies. Uh, MSRA is free of charge, so you don't have to pay to set the exam. That's that's a good thing. Uh, Sanjay, thank you for your question. No, there is no age limit for plan. Uh, sorry, there is no age limit for GP training entry. Okay. Hmm. 
All right. Uh, to be honest, if you're working as a GP in Ireland, I don't know if you need to go through the training again in the UK. Ireland is a different country, but I'm honestly I'm not sure about this, so I won't give you false information. Um, I'll just pause here for a second and I'll share the link to the feedback form, um, if that's okay. Um, uh, here it is. Just a second. Hmm. All right, so I'm sharing the link for the feedback form, if you can fill this. I'm still here for a few more minutes. Is there any limitation on the number of attempts for the MSI exam? Yes, good, good question. There is a limit, so you can take it four times both stage uh, um, I think it's the same for stage two and three but there's a limit of four times um, yes three your consultant from India can sign the crest form if you have done everything listed in the crest form uh, can we get the crest form signed in attachment also uh, it I think it's impossible to get it signed in an attachment because you can't really do everything listed during an attachment. Uh, Mispa, thank you for your question. Um, I think this is a difficult question, but yes, there are GP practices uh, in Karachi at least. I mean, you can work as a GP in Al Khan Hospital, so you can do that. Um, Okay. How do you work as a non-trainee or get NHS experience? So you get your GMC registration through any pathway. PLAB is the easiest one. Then you apply for non-training jobs and you get in. Do we need to do do we need training experience in NHS before we apply for GP? No, you do not need training experience in the NHS before you apply for training but it is best to get some non-training experience before you apply for training, as I explained earlier. Uh, Maha, thank you for your question. Yes, I, I am thinking about that. And if Dr. Raja Dhan is here, he, he'll get excited about this question. Uh, thanks, Fazan. Thank you, Farah. Um, how many years? GP training program. So the GP training program is a three-year training program. Um, when to be considered as a consultant as a GP? So the GP is not a consultant. So the GP is a GP in the UK. So that's how it works. Are there different levels of progression after completing GP training? Uh, Prithvi, thank you for your question, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean. Different levels of progression um, depends on I mean, if you're doing things the right way, then everyone progress in, in a similar way. You've got three years of training. Once you complete that, you're a GP. Uh, for ALS, it can be face-to-face -face or it can be an e-course. It, it can be either. Uh, round one reared word, will it count as, a, as an attempt? Yes, yes, it will. Uh, Will there be any change in the number of training years for the GP? There might be in the future. Uh, for now, there is not. Uh, is it important to do other degrees as well during F2 like MS Online? Uh, important? No, but depends on what your aim is. 
So for a few uh, training programs, like I think for internal medicine, it, you, you get additional marks if you've got an additional degree. For GP, it makes no difference. Having a taste your week on your CV really counts. It depends on why you're doing this. For GP training, no one, no one looks at your CV. No one cares about your CV. All they care about is this entrance test. You just need to pass the entry test. There is no interview. No one will check your CV. Ah, good question. Yes, you need to get your crest form signed every year because each year there's a new crest form. So like for this year's training program, they'll release the crest form somewhere in September or October, or they normally do it around September or October each year. So yes, you have to get it signed every year. Uh, do you need to get the crest form signed again for round two? No, you just need to get it signed once when you apply for training. Uh, how is the GP income compared to others? Uh, GPs earn a really good amount and live a very comfortable life. Even, I'm moving a bit off topic, but even as a junior doctor, you earn more than enough to live a good life, to have the latest car and to buy a house as a junior doctor. Obviously as a GP, you earn even more. So nothing to worry about. Money is not an issue in the UK. Uh, Due to COVID, AL has been postponed. Yes, Aisha, thank you. Um, I was going through the official GP recruitment website and I noticed there that they are allowing you to go through without the ALS for now, only for now, but this might change in the future. Which is the best month to start training? August is the best time to start training, but it doesn't matter. I mean, if you want training in a far off area, then you can apply in round two and start in February as well. Uh, thank you, Masood. Th thank you for your question. Yes, you do need tier two visa to start GP training, even if you are already working in the NHS. Um, Irfan, I'm, I'm really sorry. I apologize that I've missed your question. You've asked your question thrice now, you say. I'll try to go back and look for your question. Can you ask? I don't see a question. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Rajanan, thank you so much for being here and thank you for inspiring me and motivating me to do this. You deserve a lot of credit for this. Sure, I'll, I'll make this available on my page. Uh, I'm not sure how useful this will be later on, but sure. The feedback form takes 30 seconds. Omer, you've done it. Brilliant, thank you so much. Can I ask others to do the feedback form as well? I'll just share the link again. Uh, Um, Irfan, I'm waiting for your question because you mentioned that I missed that. How many times you can apply for GP training? As many times as you want, but you can fail the test only four times. MSR, how long it takes to prepare? It takes 100 hours to prepare. Can I tell you about the entrance test? We talked about this in detail. You can go through the video again and you'll find it. Four, four is the maximum number of attempts. How is the GP lifestyle? Hectic generally. I think the lifestyle is good. No nights, no weekends. Uh, so the lifestyle is not bad. By junior doctors, do you mean F2 or other non-training job? Uh, Javi, I don't know what you're asking about, but junior doctors, yes, generally means F2 or CT1, ST1, ST2, SHO jobs, anything less than a under a registrar. Um, a lot of people are asking questions about ops and gynae. We can think about doing a session about that in the future, but can't answer that right now. Um, <laughs> Irfana, I'm really sorry, but I'm getting so many comments that I can't scroll up and find your question. So if you can post it again. Uh, oh, here it is. What is the process for entering into the system of UK if you have your MBBS from China or Russia belongs to Pakistan? So Irfan? Uh, I don't think this is relevant to this topic, but you basically need to have GMC registration. So you need, PLAB is the easiest pathway for doing that. So, and also for GMC registration, you need to have an acceptable internship pattern. So there's that as well. Um, thanks, Jyoti. Thank you. Thank you for, for doing the forum. Thank you so much. Um, what is the scope of GP with special interest? The scope is great. So if you've got anything special, uh, any other diplomas or degrees or anything, um, the scope is brilliant. Uh, Aisha, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, Asma, thank you so much. 
Uh, Pooja, it's, I think PLAB is the easiest way to get GMC registration. PLAB is the easiest thing that you can do. Um, that's that's what I think, yes. Uh, Priya, thank you so much for doing the feedback form. Um, um, Alisa, you're asking if GPs have more responsibility. That's uh, maybe a difficult question. In a way, you can say that, but I, I, I don't, I, I don't know. It depends on how you look at things. Um, Fazan, you're asking how much different is salary as a GP from a consultant based in the hospital? Um, not, not much different. Uh, you can earn more or less than a consultant in the hospital. Uh, thank you so much, Harvey, for, for being here. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Princess. Thanks, Seba. Uh, Taksh, yes, it is recorded. You can find all of this. Um, I'll finish this at 12, by the way. So just three, four more minutes. Uh, how long does it take to get the crest form signed off? once you have started working the NHS. Um, so you need to work at least for three months before you can even approach a supervisor to sign your test form. Um, overall, it depends on how quickly you do things, but uh, it can, if you're new to the NHS, it, it can take a few months before you get your test form signed. Do not be in a rush to do this. Oh wow, I'm getting a lot of questions now. Uh, uh, it is difficult. Is it difficult to get a tier two visa job? Uh, no, it is not. I know a lot of people who've got tier two visa jobs. Uh, Heaven's Angel, thank you so much. Uh, Salman, about MRCGP. So I've not done MRCGP myself yet. So I would not be the best person to talk about it. But once I do, I will talk about it. Uh, thank you so much, Pascal. So my plan is to take uh, the MRCGP next year. I can't take it as ST1 anyway, so I'm not eligible right now. I can only take it once I'm ST2. Um, Amrita, thank you for being here. I, I know you have a lot of questions. So uh, if I fail to answer any questions, the best way to find information is to go to official websites. So go to all the official web, all relevant official websites uh, and find information from there. Um, if you don't find information there, send them emails and they will respond. If you still don't find information, go to Facebook groups. The best group is International Medical Graduates in the UK or IMGs in the UK. If you don't find anything, just post your question there and people will respond and help people there are extremely helpful. So you should be able to find information there as well. Um, I think I'm going to stop taking questions now, but thank you so much everyone for being here. It's been an hour um, and I enjoyed it. I will continue doing more sessions in the future, more live ones, so you can ask questions in the future as well. Again, if I if I can ask everyone to just fill the feedback form if you can, um, just as a favor to me, it won't take more than 60 seconds. So if you can just fill the feedback form, I'll share the link one last time. Um, and again, thank you so much everyone for being here. Um, I enjoyed it, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll end the stream now. Thank you. Th thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. The thanks, Pooja. Thank you for doing that. Thanks, Medea. Thanks, May. Thank you. Thank you for doing the feedback form. Uh, all right, everyone. Take care. Have a good weekend. Bye.